you. This last summer, I worked as a legal intern on a unit that negotiated contracts on behalf of the government of Rwanda with foreign investors. It was an exciting and wonderful experience. As soon as I started, a couple of weeks after, I had an opportunity to attend a press conference where the government of Rwanda and the South Korea Telecom were announcing a major joint initiative, a joint venture, to provide 4G internet throughout the country within three years. I sat and watched <coughs> officials talk about what this would mean for Rwanda, what it would mean for bringing this country into the digital age. Another official talked about what it would mean um, in terms of providing cheap, cheap, fast, and reliable internet for the entire population. And it would have an impact, he said, in uh, sectors like education and health. Now, I sat at the back of the room and I watched as the, press, the, the members of the press that were present asked the officials very tough questions afterwards. And I realized that the internet was also going to have an incredible impact on media. My name is Fatima and I'm here today to talk about the art of social change. And I want to make three points in this discussion. But before then, let me explain to you why I think visual arguments are incredible and important part of legal advocacy. So many of us come here to Harvard Law School to learn how to be um, sharp and analytic litigators, to learn the skill sets to create elegant arguments and concise um, and, and sharp and surgical, uh, uh, to how to craft that all into a compelling legal brief. But I think what's just as important is creating visual arguments. Because I think, I truly believe, that this captures hearts and minds. So I want, I'm here to make three points today. One, that storytelling is an incredible tool for advocates. Two, that technology and new technology will enable all advocates to, to broadcast their messages to more people. And three, that this is an incredible opportunity when those two are harnessed together. It's an incredible opportunity, and I put this picture up to remind me of what's at stake. This is a photo of children who lost their lives during the Rwandan genocide. And this is at the museum, and it's on your way out, and it's to remind you, and for me, it reminded me so dearly of what is at stake when media can incite violence. So let's start. Storytelling. We all love stories. Throughout humanity, we, we are so engaged um, and drawn into dynamic individuals who are able to enthrall us and take us to new worlds. It helps convey and transmit. Storytelling is a, is a way to transmit information and helps install um, and still uh, values and, 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 and morals that are important to a culture. Um, it's not a coincidence that some of the best stories are in religious texts. And I also think that storytelling has been important because some of the best educators in my life have been amazing storytellers who leave you understanding and engage you the entire process as, and, and help you understand why um, good, good, uh, you know, good citizenship and ethical behaviors are important in society. And finally, storytelling is just, it's a way we escape from the everyday realities that we face. Um, it's, it provides us humor and levity, and it takes us away. <laughs> so as a child, um, I watched a lot of film. I read a lot, too. Um, but I was someone who was always engrossed in either books or uh, I wanted to be taken away to another world. Um, and it was interesting to me, the very first time I watched a Disney movie, Aladdin, it, it took me into an entirely new world, a whole new world, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there were elements of that movie that appealed to me. There were elements I didn't quite understand. And the wonderful thing is that same TV set that took me away helped me bear witness to the reality around us. My family is from <coughs> Somalia, and growing up, we watched a lot of television, a lot of CNN, because that's how we sort of process what was happening. Uh, that's how my parents processed what was happening back home. 
And as a child, you know, if I wasn't reading, like I said, and if I wasn't um, watching movies, I was watching the news with my parents. I loved it because it also took me away from the reality I was living. And, you know, through watching CNN and children's um, programming that are children targeted to children, like Nick News, I was able to learn that not only were things not right in Somalia, but also in Bosnia and Yugoslavia, it helped me feel like I could learn about a whole other world and to care. To care what was happening thousands of miles away. <coughs> so, good storytelling. And now technology. I think what technology is doing is it's providing a way for new devices to, tell, to be vehicles for new stories, to be vehicles for um, understanding the realities of people all around the world. And, the, and the, 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 the reality here, too, is that two-thirds of the world is still not um, connected. Uh, and two-thirds of the world, and maybe even more, don't have iPhones, don't have you know, the, these products that we use every day in our lives to keep connected. But that's changing. Um, companies like Facebook and Google, they're, in, they're racing to put down ways for people in, these, uh, in, in developing worlds to get on, to get online. And when they do, the question for me is, what happens? What, what, what media and what content are they going to be reading? What stories are they going to be seeing? I argue here that when the next billion people come online, that they're going to demand content that is meaningful, that is educational, that is representative of them and their cultures and the values that they hold. And that's engaging, too. And so I think that this presents an incredible opportunity. You know, traditionally media has been controlled by a few groups, by a few companies. Um, when you look at this board, I, I, for me, when I looked at this picture, I thought, whose stories are these companies telling, and whose and what voices are missing? When when so many of what we're so much of what we're exposed to today <coughs> is curated and distributed by a few, with monetary you know ideas and ideas in mind, right? Now, I think that that's being disrupted. Um, I, I'm, I'm on Twitter, and partially why I joined is because I wanted to get a sense of what was happening around the world to keep my, you know, to get a pulse on what was happening, but also to, to, um, to read up on news and different articles. And what I found by joining this site is not that it's just that. Honestly, it's in a place where such incredible conversations happen. And these sub subcultures, as they call are not really subcultures. What I have here are hashtag conversations that have caused public, uh, I mean, you know, Twitter's been a forum for these global conversations to happen. And the funny thing is, mainstream media is writing about conversations that are happening on Twitter. And when you think about who is on Twitter, data from earlier this year um, was saying that nearly 80% of the users on Twitter are actually not from the US. So it's an incredibly diverse set of, of people online and engaging in great conversation. And when I think about the next set of billions of people who are going to get on, now they may not all get on Twitter, like I'm not here trying to advertise for them, but I'm saying that when they do get online, in whatever platform, what, you know, it may be Facebook, it may be, and I hope it's through independent blogging and whatnot, there's going to be a rich, rich discussion to draw upon. So why does this matter? Why does it matter to advocates? Why does it matter to law students? Because I think persuasive storytelling is important. I think persuasive storytelling can um, you know, have a variety of impacts. It can create an impact on uh, legislation, on policies. But I think even television shows help shift us and help, and, and help shift our opinions on, um, on groups of people on groups of people. This is incredibly important. Now you guys may be thinking, Fatima, the revolution is not going to happen through watching television. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right, like, uh, you know, as this earlier picture showed, it happens through brave protesters willing to put their life on the line. And we cannot forget about them. But I too want to show you this because recently, um, just actually January this year, a study was released that showed um, an incredible impact of two TV shows on MTV, 16 and Pregnant and Teen Mom. These two TV shows, they argue, 
said contributed to almost a third of the overall decline in teen pregnancy in the U.S. That's a reality TV show. Um, it got, it got, you know, the, this age group that was targeted was <coughs> online. They were Googling. They were getting in conversations on Twitter. It's, it's documented in this study, and I encourage you to look at it. But this is part of the reason I'm incredibly excited. I'm incredibly excited. And my vision here, after I leave this, uh, after I leave law school, is to combine powerful stories with new technologies and technologies that already exist and think about how to get that to a global audience and how the global audience can then help us understand and how we can incorporate the rich tapestries of different cultures in what we consume. I'm incredibly um, optimistic about this and um, I think it's important particularly in places of conflict where voices that you know, we haven't heard voices from and the voices that are typically on the airs are very, um, they present a certain type of perspective. So if this is something that you're interested in, join me. Let's do this together. Thank you.